Uh, I was in a hotel in Chitral in northern Pakistan, and I met two um, Afghan refugees, and they started telling me about this war that was raging in their country, which was literally just over the next mountain. And they said, uh, you know, you should come and uh, photograph and tell this story because nobody knows about what's happening. There was one man who spoke English. He was a, a teacher, and he was the one who explained to me that uh, these villages have been destroyed. So we walked for about four days up and down these mountains <laughs> to try and get to this one particular area. Actually, it was this area. And um, it started out as um, th these kind of farmers and shepherds uh, defending their valley, their, mm -hmm. their tribe, their uh, village. And it seemed like a very noble endeavor. Mm -hmm. So there was this big meeting so all these men are getting together and deciding, you know, how are we going to respond? What are we going to do? Uh, should we fight? Should we, you know, how are we going to, what's our strategy? They got very close to them. If we look at this picture, for example, here they are observing a, a road. Or yeah. What, what are they doing? Well, there's, there's a convoy of army trucks coming up the trail, which is down in the valley. And this is in a kind of on the border of uh, Kunar province in sort of Nuristan. And they would ambush these convoys and uh, steal their guns and whatever material they could get their hands. But they totally trusted you. They, they, nobody oh, yeah. cares that, that you are no. there. Doing your no, they were extremely hospitable, very friendly, uh, very helpful in terms of helping me to, uh, uh, you know, carry equipment or to, uh, to feed me or to get, give me a place to sleep. I mean, they, they treat, really treated me like an honored guest. The end of the first trip, I was able to, when I sent my photographs back, um, there was a magazine called uh, Gayo in, in, uh, from, from uh, Hamburg, yeah. And they, they used a couple of my pictures, so I thought this was really the first time I had been published in a major magazine. It was when the Russians invaded in, I would say, December of 1979, just a few days uh, after Christmas. Um, then it became this big international news story, and suddenly uh, my, my, these pictures th th became, uh, they were being published literally all over the world, all over Europe and the States, all, you know, everywhere. Yeah, I was in a camp one morning and I heard voices. Uh, there was a school, it was a girls' school. So I went over and I walked in and I saw these students sitting on the floor and I asked the teacher, can I photograph? Do you mind if I, st I had the permission from the, the camp. So I um, immediately saw this little girl, this Sharbat Gula, mm -hmm. with these amazing eyes. And I instantly knew that, that this was gonna make a really powerful portrait. So I um, just spent the whole time trying to manage, think, you know, how can I convince her? Convince her, how can I do this? I have like one chance and I don't want her to say no. So I started photographing some of the other students in the class to try and create a situation where she would see that this was okay, nothing, there was anything wrong, and then maybe create a bit of fun. I mean, she, she's an orphan, she was a refugee, uh, she's had a very, she'd had a very difficult life at that point. You, you know, there's a lot of dirt on her face. You can see this. There, this is a mm -hmm. bit of dirt mm -hmm. on the nose. She has a scar. Mm -hmm. uh, her shawl is ripped from a fire, which was in the kitchen. So you were aware from the very first beginning of the importance of this, of this picture? Well, I had a discussion with the picture editor. Mm -hmm. uh, the system at the, at the National Geographic was that we select pictures with a picture editor, and then once we've put the selection together, we take that mm -hmm. to the editor-in-chief, and then the editor-in-chief looks at the work and decides uh, which pictures he puts in the magazine. Mm -hmm. And um, there were two versions of this. There was this version and one of her, yeah, she's a bit with, with, her, with her, yeah. And the picture editor thought that was a better choice because he thought this was too disturbing. He thought this picture was, he said, I don't think people want to keep this on their coffee table 
for uh, you know for for a month because it's like whoa this is kind of intense look. Uh, but when the editor of the magazine uh, saw this picture, he he literally jumped out of his chair and said, "There's our next cover." <laughs> and here it is. That's yeah. the the Natural Geographic, which has been published. It brought a lot of attention to Afghan refugees. People came and worked and volunteered in the camps, uh, inspired by this picture. Then there is this other very impressive portrait of another girl. I photographed her in uh, 2002. We were actually looking for the Afghan girl. We had gone to try and find the teacher who was in the school the day that I photographed the Afghan girl. And we were literally just walking down the street and I saw this girl and she had this incredible look and these kind of, she had these kind of blue eyes. It's wonderful, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, we were in a kind of in a hurry and I asked the uncle if I could come back in the evening and meet them again and mm -hmm. photograph. Looking at your portraits, you once said that, that it is worth waiting until the soul of the person being photographed appears. Yeah, I think it's just trying to find the, the right moment, the right attitude, the right um, feeling about the person. Um, sometimes it can happen very quickly, you know, within just a matter of a, of a few seconds. And this relationship you have with the person, uh, it, it, even though it may only last for uh, a minute or three minutes or five minutes, uh, I, I really believe that there's that animalistic chemistry that mm -hmm. you develop. Uh, and you are close to these people when you photograph them, or I mean the, the, mm -hmm, the yeah. I, I always I want to be right next to them. I want to mm -hmm. be very close, as close as I possibly can be. So th this particular man is a magician from a nomad tribe mm -hmm. uh, called the Rabari people. And um, he, they, they dress in, and they, they, their hair and their beard is it's very flamboyant so that when they go into a village they can attract a lot of attention and they want to get a crowd gathered so they can perform and earn some money. But did he already have contact with Westerners? Yeah, no, I was with a, uh, a friend who um, lived in this area. He knew this man. He invited this man to come and meet me. I always work with a local person because uh, if there's a problem or if somebody wants to talk to me or something, I need somebody who can understand what people are talking about. Uh, around me, so because we're walking down the street, I'm photographing, and sometimes you inadvertently might photograph the wrong thing or be in the wrong place, and you need somebody to be there and say, you know, we shouldn't be here. Uh, I can hear people talking. Yeah. We've made a mistake or we've done something where we're not. So then we can extract ourselves, leave, or we can apologize or whatever. Or in a more positive way, if I wanted to um, go into somebody's home or into a shop or talk to somebody and say, uh, you know, I'd like to come back tomorrow and visit with you. Mm -hmm. You can do that if you have a local person. I've always worked with a, with a translator. Sometimes you have problems if you get uh, too close to people, that they get shy or they, they yeah. say, no, please uh, leave me alone. I think in most cases, um, if you treat people in a certain way with respect, uh, they're more than happy to pr participate in your project and be photographed. It's rare that somebody refuses and doesn't want to uh, participate. This is one of my favorite pictures from India. This was taken in 1984, but it could just as well have been taken 200 years ago. You have this sort of ancient steam locomotive, which no longer exists. Uh, juxtaposed with the Taj Mahal, which is probably the most iconic 
buildings in all of the world. And these uh, workmen uh, moving this locomotive down the track. Um, and it really evokes a feeling of the past. For me, uh, the, um, the character, the personality of a place, to be able to um, show what's unique about this part, of what separates India from, say, Europe or Africa or whatever. Uh, there was a time when we were all very uh, different. We all had a kind of individual cultures. There was a uniqueness to uh, the Chinese, uh, the way their architecture and the dress and the food and music, everything else. And you can say that about each country. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, that individuality, that distinctive character is what fascinates me. Well, I was just in India um, two days ago and when I, the, the way people dress now is almost exactly the way we dress right here. Mm -hmm. um, when I first went to India, there were turbans and certain traditional clothes. The uniqueness is really, I think, uh, in danger. Is is and, and it's a pity because it's uh, uh, it's fun to have uh, you know the differences and different yeah. sort of uh, yeah. yeah. Then how many of the photographs they look like? Everything has been arranged. Is it a lot of effort you need to to create these these sceneries, or is everything just um, in front of your lens and you don't have nothing to do? Well, I think when you're trying to craft a picture, you can. I was wondering before I even arrived at this location. You know, I was wondering if will the train and the Taj Mahal be in this close proximity, so I can get them in the same picture. When I did this story on a train journey across India, almost the first journey was just taking notes. Mm -hmm. I spent maybe a week or 10 days just, dry, uh, just being on the train and n noting what was interesting in which place. Uh, so I wanted to see the whole thing. And then I would say, okay, I need to go to these 12 places in order to show it in the best possible mm -hmm. way. But then you have it in, in your imagination, you already know a lot about this future picture to come. Yeah, the, to me there's two ways of working. One is a picture that you study the schedule, the train, to know when it's going to be there, uh, the light, and it, that there's a lot of preparation. That's kind of one way of working. Another way of working is simply to walk out the door and be open to any eventuality, any serendipitous moment. Um, to me that's the more enjoyable way of working. Mm -hmm unplanned, unscripted, just kind of go with the flow. There's a touch of humor in the picture Absolutely. because of uh, oh, yeah. there are these very earnest shoppers out there looking completely covered and uh, yet they have all these kind of modern shoes hanging from this in in this part of the world, especially in Afghanistan, particularly in this Pashtun culture, uh, it's completely forbidden to photograph a woman, regardless if they're covered. Even if they're covered from head to toe, you still have no permission. And if if a husband or a brother or a relative or even a passerby sees you pointing your camera, uh, it, it can really be uh, they could kill you and be within their rights. I think it's always important to treat people with dignity and respect, mm -hmm. honor people's culture. But I, I do think that um, it's also important to have a record or a memory of, of how we live, how these people live, how their lives are similar but contrast to ours. So I, I think that, um, you know, for me, I, I think it's justified to take this picture. This is in a, a mosque in Kabul. And as you can imagine, there's so many widows in Afghanistan because of the men have mm -hmm. either been killed or they've left the country to find work. Uh, so there's an amazing amount of widows. Um, 
So they've come to the entrance of the mosque, and she's begging, and there are these passers-by. Which give the shadow here. Yeah. And, uh, but it is the graphic quality of this picture, I think, is very strong. You know, the, the, the shadows and her, her hand kind of helping, asking for help. And then this hand and this hand is mm -hmm. kind of a interesting, uh, and this very strong shape. And then these, these lines here mm -hmm. and this, this mm -hmm. door. So this one was exposed on film? This is Kodachrome. in film. Yeah, yeah this yeah. is Kodachrome. Generally spoken, this, this change from analog to digital uh, photograph, what, what happened for you? Well, I was kind of hoping that I could finish out my career in using film. And I thought, well, the, you know, the digital was not so great, the quality. And it, the whole sort of revolution in, in technology and the, the, the transformation from film, it happened so fast. All the, our, all the research and development in the camera industry was going all into digital. And it was improving rapidly every year that it was getting better and better. Whereas uh, today, I think the digital is so far superior to film that I can't even dream of ever taking another picture with film. In the old days, when it got sort of dark, you know, I, I'd really be the end of the day. But now the cameras are so good and so sensitive that you can work uh, past dark and you can shoot virtually any time. And from an aesthetic point of view, do you see some, is it different than, than it was before? I think there's a lot to be said for being able to evaluate the light, the composition, the design instantly, which with in, in film, you never knew what you had. There's nothing about film that I'm nostalgic about. The only thing about film which I miss is it was a real thing. You can take those pictures, put them in your drawer, and come back in 20 years, and they're there. But do you have an archive of hard copies as well to, to be a little bit protected from yeah. these? Well, I, that's a very good point. I've always thought that these pictures we take with a digital camera don't exist. They're in a hard drive. They're all X's and O's or whatever, yeah. uh, ones, and, ones and zeros. So th they don't really exist. I mean, uh, unless you, you know, plug in the hard drive into a computer and then you see it on a screen. But they're not, it, it's not like a print that mm -hmm. you can put on the wall or, I mean, they, they, that's a real thing, uh, whereas on a screen, it only exists because of electricity. So I, I was in the central Rangoon one morning, and I saw these nuns silently walking through the streets in the rain, collecting their food for the day. The system is that the locals give them um, their rice and they put it in these bowls as a donation. So I, I saw these women and then I, as I was following them, I saw this incredible little colonial building with the red and the blue. And it just seemed, I thought, this is gonna be uh, the color and the juxtaposition is going to be really strong because of the the complementary colors and and the reflection in the in the on the on the walkway here. But this is like like a stage you discovered and and then you you wait there for minutes or even hours until yeah. there there are some people well, and spent, subjects entering. Yeah, I spent six months in Burma mm -hmm. on this particular trip, and I probably went out with monks and nuns. Uh, maybe 20 or 30 times, different places, different occasions. Mm -hmm. So I would say this picture is a result of hours and days of searching and exploring and trying different things. If you work the situation with a keen eye and patience uh, and you're, you're intelligent about where you go, and you'll eventually probably get a good picture. This, I think, is just an example of really hard work and um, spending hours and hours in, in this kind of situation. And how do you manage that? At the end, it, it still looks like a, a brilliant snapshot. 
it looks very spontaneous, uh, like just well, that's by because accident. it is. That's yeah. because it's, it's it's that's because I found them, I walked with them, and boom, I shot the picture, and um, it, it, it was there was zero planning that went into this picture. I just happened to be there at that moment, took the picture, and probably the next five minutes, I was off somewhere else. Yeah. So it's not it, it's not really luck. It's just perseverance mm. and persistence. But I think it's very impressive that if you look at the people you are photographing, that they, it, it seems as if they are not aware that you are around. Well, one way is to just to photograph when they're not looking at you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, in this case, I think they, um, I had alerted them. My, my assistant told them that we were going to be following them. You know, they have this festival every year called uh, Holy, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a festival of color. So people get together, and the way they celebrate this festival is they throw color. It could be blue or red or yellow or green, and it's either a powder or it can be a, a liquid. But uh, you, after you've gone through this festival, you're completely covered. So after this festival was over, I, I was walking through the back alleyways of, um, of Jodhpur. And this, this town, uh, the old quarter is all painted blue. So I'm walking through the, this uh, alleyways and I, I noticed uh, all these hands that somebody had done made this design. And I just saw it and I thought, this, is, this frame, this design of the hands in the wall could make a really interesting uh, picture. So people were coming and going. There were cows and people coming with things on their head and all sorts of things. And I, I kept, I waited there for maybe two hours. Kept showed, shooting and shooting and shooting. And then the next day I went back again for just a, a few minutes. I, I think it's a common device to, as you're walking through a town or a village or a city, to suddenly see a scene, uh, kind of a backdrop, and you know that as people or a dog or a cat or a car or whatever, as they interact with that background, it can help the juxtaposition between the, the backdrop and the figures interacting or walking or whatever. Have you found for yourself some like recipes of to to create an image, like references, for example, to a painting or to other photographs? For me, I've learned so much from uh, artists about the use of light. Uh, you can't underestimate uh, the importance of light and the quality of light in a picture. I think that's uh, one of the great lessons I've learned in my work. I always. For me, I prefer to work in low contrast, uh, muted, uh, cloudy uh, days where there's no real, there's the, the, the highlights and the shadows isn't a, a great difference. I, I, I rarely, almost never work outside on a sunny day. Mm -hmm. Natural light in general is, is extremely important for your work. And well, uh, yeah, I think it's better to go natural, go the way the light is. As soon as you start to interfere, so as soon as you start to light, it looks maybe more managed, looks more, um, I think people will become aware that there's something that's not, something artificial perhaps about the scene. Mm -hmm. I, I, the other thing is that it's just easier to work with natural light. The hauling around a bunch of lights and setting up lights is, maybe too much work and takes part of the fun out of photography. Kashmir is this, uh, they, they call it the Switzerland of uh, the Himalayas because of the mountains and when I got there I saw all these vendors selling flowers on these boats and I saw them from the distance and I thought that's going to make an amazing picture. I would meet them in the morning at the market and I would sit in the back of their, of their canoe and I would 
travel with them as they sold these flowers and took them to shops and homes and hotels. And uh, I went, I was, I went out maybe ten times at different, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and, and and one day, uh, you know, the light was nice. We were in this sort of sort of canal, and um, as a, there there was this highlight here, and his his hand and his paddle fit very mm -hmm. well right into that. Is it uh, not a big work to be done in, in the laboratory once you, you come back and, and you, you refine your pictures? What we do in the darkroom now or in post-production is pretty much what we used to do in black and white. If this was a black and white picture, we would probably try and open this up, maybe lighten it a bit and, and maybe darken some of the, the water and lighten, try and keep detail in his in his in his vest, maybe darken his hat a bit if it's too bright. A bit more contrast. Mm -hmm. And then maybe try and balance the flowers out so that they don't, you know. But that, that's, uh, that's exactly what we would have done in black and white. Y you want to draw the eye to certain parts of the picture. And in printing, that's the objective, is to uh, guide the eye and to have a balance between light areas and dark areas. Many of your pictures look like, like they were a bit romantic, the way they're, they're constructed, the, the way they speak to us. Do you believe that it makes us, as, as spectators, easier to, to access these cultures uh, with this embellished world? Well, you know, I, I photograph, which is the truest to my, to my gut and to my, the way I feel, uh, I should work. I, I never intentionally want to embellish anything or make it better than it actually is. I'm just trying to show it in for me in the way that tells the best possible story. I don't want to change it uh, for the sake of some criticism or somebody saying, you know, uh, pretending that I'm or saying, claiming that I'm kind of beautifying something that shouldn't be beautified, like a refugee camp or some disaster. I mean, I, I, I photograph from the heart and uh, then let, let the chips fall where they may. <laughs> <laughs>